We build walls when we ought to be building bridges And we lose touch when we ought to be holding on And we hold back when we really should be giving And we hold out when we're holding on to nothing at all Freedom from fear of certain fear my name is Pete, and I uh, grew up in South Burlington. I'm a grandson of uh, refugees from World War I in Eastern Europe. Um, um, this is World Refugee Day, so I think I want to start off by saying one of my observations in a, in a very long and uh, um, strange career in the military. I, uh, one of the things that struck me was how many people get left out of a, of a permanent solution when we impose peace uh, as a hegemon in the world. My name is John Turner. From 2003 to 2007, I was enlisted in the United States Marine Corps of Infantry and three airplane airplanes. During that time, I deployed three times to the Haiti in 2004, and then to Iraq in 2005 and 2006. During the heart of the war, it was often to those back home is to rebuild them, to be able to rebuild, to build schools, to build uh, democracy. But what we don't talk about is the destruction that goes with it. I am 27 years old and I've been in the country for eight months. I come from Iraq. I am originally from Harvard. Would anybody very surprised to hear if I say you went to bed with your parents, and the next thing you know is what has been one of your parents is one of your parents was shot, and another parents, and the other of your parents, other your other siblings are missing. That is the life of people living every day in the war zone. My name is Lucia. So my dad was army general. He, he worked for uh, Somali government. And my mom, she was a politician. She had a pizza salon in uh, one of the biggest hotels in Somalia. Juba Hotel. So our life were normal. The day I was born, they said that as soon as I was born, they had to run. It is a rainy season in there, and it is very hot inside. I get to see that uh, when I was a little uh, grew up, about five or six years old, I witnessed how um, my mother, the incident that always in my mind was that my mother was about to give a birth to a baby, my younger brother, and that is, there was a news that we had to move. And she was already really in pain, about to give birth, and then we had to move. The news that we had to move. So I, at that time, I did not know how it was, it is difficult, but now I, I cannot imagine how it, it is difficult. Ten years old. Um, that is the military operations. What's going on in our where we were hiding, and our camp was raided about 3 p.m. in the morning, and my uh, my mother was shot. Uh, many friends of mine were uh, were were killed just because they were just because of who they are. We went into this house at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, woke up the family, and told them that they had to leave. Now when Colleen first asked me to be a part of this, this, this panel tonight, I didn't really understand why. I was a veteran, I'm a veteran, I was at war. It didn't make sense to me, but then I sat and talk about, thought about it. And it's because as my job as an infantryman, we were essentially creating refugees daily. understand that that's what that, that, that's, that, that's, that's what we did, you know, is this family who was sleeping in the middle of the night was woken up by 
these guys in flak jackets and with machine guns and told to leave their home, the comfort of their home, which had already been pretty much destroyed because of the firefights they were getting into. But now they're being forced from their home and all their belongings were gathered placed in one room and then carted away, which I'm sure just ended up in a burn pit or a dump. And that's... Uh, after I've done college, I went and worked for the American Army as an interpreter. Uh, I worked with the military police at first. We used to train the Iraqi police, the, the really new Iraqi police, the fragile, to, to the, those people with no training. Because the American Army, when they came, they disbanded the, the old army. So these people were, were new to guns and stuff, and we used to train them to fight really powerful terrorism that comes from Al-Qaeda. Those people have a lot of training. Those people are smart and those people are well equipped. My deployment to the second deployment to Iraq was seven months long. And during that time, we gradually watched families leave their homes because of the amount of destruction and chaos that was occurring. The southern, the southern part of the compound was constantly getting hit from insurgency that we don't know who they were, but we were required to shoot back because we had to protect our own lives. But yet we're firing in neighborhoods where there's women and there's children and there's families and gardens without respect towards this people, these people, this society, this culture that we had invaded. What I want to talk about today is the uh, War of 2003, because that's what I remember, remember the most. It's really hard to sum it up in 10 minutes, but I'm going to try. When we first heard about the war, we prepared by buying food, uh, saving money, gathering up with family, and my family, my uncle's family, and my aunt's family, we all gathered in, my, in our house. Uh, and days after, we heard the raid. It's, I don't know if you heard, the, if you know what the raid is, it's, it's the sound that tells you it's happening. And after that, uh, we started to hear the bombings. The bombing was really, really, the house shook with every, every one of, um, whichever, with every one of them, even though it was made of concrete. 20 days after, 25 days. So we were scared because of the bombing, but we were at the same time happy that finally we were getting rid of Saddam Hussein. And uh, after that, 25 days after the, the war was over, Saddam Hussein was gone, and we were happy for four, five months till the civil war and the terrorism kicked in. <coughs> People start to die. This is one of the pictures I found from a family friend. So, family friend, I, I don't have any knowledge about them, but the family friend told me none of them died in a healthy and peaceful way. All of them get hit by civil war, effectively. Effectively. They have been killed by the civil war. By different means. And then they joined a resistance group. Since then, they can no longer go back to their home towns. So they were always in the jungle, hiding away. So I was born in the jungle, literally in the jungle. There are also other people who are in the jungle too, who are running away from governments, interrogations, <coughs> governments, persecution. So a group of us has about 80 people. So we don't have a permanent settlement. We don't have a permanent homes and places. We are always on the run. So at one camp, we will stay about one or two days. At some camps, we can stay months and years. So the deeper the jungle we can go, it is safer for us. And we were always on the ground, and we grow our own foods, and we raise our own chickens and cows for meat. There are quite a number of children. We, there is uh, no education. 
I, the first day I remember now is that my mother is the one who is teaching me how to read and how to write alphabet, one is alphabet. We don't have a textbook. I remember that my mother was telling my father that he, she really wants a textbook for me. I want to share with you one of the incidents that happened while I was in high school. In 1997, while the school was in session and the glasses was gone, the militia attacked to our school. They raided the school. They took all the supplies, books, computer supplies, everything. And if you, nobody can imagine how difficult it was to govern all that things, and how, how difficult it went through to get all the supplies. And I worked for the American Army for, uh, for three years. And uh, after that, I applied for, for a visa to the United States. A lot of, uh, a lot of my friends in the Army helped me to, uh, to obtain the visa. Uh, my friend, Staff Sergeant Saul, he encouraged me, he's the one who told me, go for it, man. And he, he helped me a lot with the, with the visa paperwork, because a lot of forms, a lot of background checks, a lot of medical checks. But when we come home without proper reintegration, we're sitting there struggling just as much as the refugees, the people that we force from their homes are struggling. And we are supposed to be living in a society that's peaceful, that's compassionate. But yet, to other societies, we can barely show that essence of who we are. And, uh, and of course, all the fears of coming here. My friends started to tell me, Americans will think of you as a terrorist as soon as they hear your name. Americans think of Arab as those dirty people that care, care nothing uh, except about the money and, and that stuff. I, of course I don't believe them. I already worked with the army and I, and, I, and I know that wasn't right. So how do we treat these people when they come here? Do we look at them in the color of their skin? You're black, you're brown, you're yellow, you're white? And we treat them with disrespect? Do we say, hey brother, sister, your blood's red, I'm red. We're the same people. We have hearts, we have feelings, we have emotions. Is there any possible way we can show respect towards someone because of their differences? And can we see beyond the illusions that we create and the fears that we create in order to be peaceful with the society? Before the Civil War, we never had, I never had any problem. But after the Civil War, it destroyed most of the, our my personality. It either mentality or spiritually or physical, it, it, it's going to destroy all your person, who you are. So we, it, was, it was something we can not imagine. It's, what I can say, it's a man-made disaster. The environmental impact of war is, is absolutely ridiculous, especially with the munitions that we're using, the depleted uranium, which has a half-life of four billion years. So those who choose to do to stay, not only do they have to rebuild their homes and their huts and their gardens and their lives and their families, but they also have to live in a space that's completely contaminated with radioactive material. Now what kind of cleanup do we do about that? What kind of rebuilding is set up on that issue? And what kind of moral support are we going to provide to these innocent peoples? These children, these women, these elders, these men, these boys who have, since 2003 and 2001, known nothing but war. There were a bunch of kids arrested by the, the military troops. So our, about two or three days after they are 
wandering around and finally the military soldiers that they were released. They released the children. They released the children and then the children finally come back to where we were hiding and finally we got our children back. Uh, two, two months after I got, I got the visa in September, I started to say goodbye to family, friends, and uh, of course saying goodbye to my mom was one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I, I came here in November 2012, and, uh, and after two and a half days trip, as soon as I stepped, uh, in America, I get a lot of help from the guys at PRRB. Fu Blama, my case manager, uh, picked me up from the airport and took me to a family from Nepal, Nepal that hosted me for two weeks. After that, Capel found me in an apartment. Judy, Judy, the director of PRRB, met me a week after I arrived. And I was such a, it was such a relief to talk to her and uh, know that they are really committed to help me uh, and, uh, and care about me. So, after I left the country and I went to another country, still I was having a problem. Because getting to another country, you have to go through the process. It's not easy. So finally, I came to the United States in 2008 through the Mahmoud Center Program. I'm safe now, I'm working, I have a job, but I'm only just myself. As I met, as I showed you, how it's important being with your family and how it's difficult. By and after we were in, in refugee camps, um, my father go back to my father went back to Burma, continued doing his political activities, went back to Burma, and he, he married. And yes, soon after that, he was arrested and tortured and. He was that. He was that. He left his wife and 14 years old son, so they were sent to prison. So my the youngest brother was present when he, he was 14 days old until he was five years old. Okay. I'm a two tour of Vietnam veteran. When I was in Vietnam, I picked up a phrase, Bu Doi. I asked about the little kids running around the streets or running around the edge of the camp and living in the garbage dumps. And I was told by a Vietnamese friend of mine, Udoi, dust of light. Refugees are dust of light. In Vietnam, we deliberately generated refugees. We forced a huge percentage of the population into urban areas where they could be um, it's when I come home from my overseas adventures, it doesn't get any easier every time. In fact, it's gotten a lot harder. And one of the reasons is uh, corruption here in the United States. Um, it's endemic. The Europeans are telling us, and, and I and I support their assessment that um, the corruption in Washington, the corruption outside of Vermont, is tremendous, tremendous. Um, and it's like. In a, and I feel, as a veteran coming home to it, uh, I, I feel a kinship with some of the refugees that I see in our community. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to volunteer in a great organization. I guess, first of all, I appreciate this program because even in my anti war work, we don't talk about refugees enough. And I guess my question would be what can we do as Vermonters? to make life better for refugees, maybe to better educate friends, neighbors, uh, bring things up with our town, with the local governments. What kind of assistance do you guys not get that would be additionally helpful for you? How are we going to move forward?
forth as a people in order to build sustainable lives and environments that will nourish life instead of destroying it. And I ask everyone sitting here in this room today to really think about what difference you make toward in your own life, in your community, in your environment, within your family, and with someone who have no idea who they are. It's a nightmare. We wake up, um, that's the time we just start our second page of our life. So what's happening now in Syria, it's similar like that. You know, certain people will get hurt. Uh, as you see, more Syrians go to the refugee camp. They really need help. It's not a matter of uh, the two group side. The matter is the innocent people. Uh, I was surprised by how people here are open-minded. Nobody cared where I'm from. I got a job, a good job. My boss is really, really great. Uh, and I made a lot of friends. I've been playing soccer, go running, hang out with people. A couple of my friends here, Natalia and Daria. And uh, I mean, like, people, people here are great. I was really amazed by the equality, liberty, and justice in this country. I just want to say thank you uh, for all of your understanding of, uh, of what we've been through. And so if we believe in peace, we believe in justice, we believe in liberty, and all these beautiful moral values that we hold, then go out and display it in some way. If you don't believe in war or an invading force to enter a country, then go out on the side of the street and talk about what you do believe in. Believe in peace. Don't believe in something that's negative, or don't be against something that's negative. Be, some, be for something that's positive. If we continue to keep these negative connotations in our mind, we're going to do nothing but create negativity. So instead of being against something, go be for something. Go be for peace. Go be for justice. Go be for good health. Whatever it may be. And every step that you take, will make a difference, will make change in your own life by having these positive affirmations. Freedom from fear of certain failure Freedom from the bar we place across every door Freedom from things we just imagine Freedom from all that came before Yeah. 